Now, in the early 20th century, which is before most of our time here, the great polar explorer Ernest Shackleton placed an advertisement in the newspaper, probably the London Times, I'd imagine, for an expedition with Ernest Shackleton to Antarctica. Men wanted for hazardous journey. Low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return doubtful, (laughs) honour and recognition in event of success. It sounds like the kind of ad that our teacher in Ecclesiastes might place. An advertisement for life under the sun. You've probably heard the saying, there's two things that you can be certain of in life, two certainties in life, what are they? Death and taxes, it's tax time, and death as well, as we have been reminded this week, is always with us. And that in a nutshell is our teacher's big idea today in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. There are just two things that you can be sure of, and this is our outline for today as well, two things that you can be certain of in life under the sun. Firstly, there's death in verses 1 to 6. And secondly, there's taxes, the taxes of time and chance. And these taxes we read of in verses 11 to 16. And this really is a timely word, as as we've said this week with the death of Jim, the funeral of Harold. This year, In state parliaments around Australia, various bills are being brought uh, to parliament regarding voluntary assisted dying, or what we would usually term euthanasia. And today, in fact, this very minute, in the next 60 seconds, although 250 new lives will be welcomed into the world around around the globe, by the time this couple of sentences is done, 100 women and men perhaps very old, perhaps very young, will have met their final fate. Death and the taxes of time and chance. And yet between these two imposing icebergs of our finitude on the one hand and our fate on the other, our teacher or our navigator manages to steer a safe and what turns out to be a pleasing course. Which way will our navigator point us? Well, that's why we need our compass close at hand. God's word, the true compass in life. And we need to make sure that it's pointing in the direction of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. That's why it'll be helpful for you to have your compasses open at page 541. Page 541. And as we begin, let me pray with just part of the collect for this Sunday that we use in our services here and across the Anglican Church throughout the world. The collect for the 17th Ordinary Sunday goes like this. Almighty God, increase and multiply upon us your mercy so that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not the things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Well, we're going to begin this first leg of our expedition with the first certainty of life, the first of two great certainties of life viewed under the sun, and of course the first of these is death. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses 1 to 6 and the teacher begins by looking back at all the ground that he's covered on his voyage so far, this epic journey of discovery and verse 1 he reflects on this perilous course and he says, this whole journey I have laid to heart, examining examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God whether it is love or hate that confronts them, one does not know. 
Everything that confronts them is havel, vanity, going, going, gone. Why is this the case? Well, the teacher says it's because the same fate comes to all. Verse 2. To the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to those who sacrifice and those who do not sacrifice, to those who come to church and those who don't come to church, to those who pay their taxes and those who are not completely honest with the receipts they submit or the return that they hand in. As are the good, so are the sinners, those who swear as those who don't. Again, this is an evil in all that happens under the sun. And what is it? The same again, that the same fate falls upon everyone. And at last, this fate, which has been bubbling in the background of all of these chapters of Ecclesiastes, popping up every now and again, this ultimate source of frustration and futility that the teacher's been feeling ever since he stepped on board the the boat, back in chapter 1. At last, this fate has a face, and this face is the face of death. Notice, will you, that the first conclusion that the teacher draws as he looks back on his journey in verse number 1 is that All people and all things, all of us, are in the hand of God. Verse 1, all things, all deeds, all people in God's safe hands. We need to hear that on a week like this. And yet although God alone is sovereign, he's in charge over all things, well, this means that for us, we cannot know what lies ahead, only God knows what lies before us, whether love or hate, whether in this life or in the next. Or in the next. Because under God, death is the great leveller of us all. If we had been sitting together, not today on the 30th of July, but on the 25th of August of the year AD 79, in a city not too much larger or smaller than our own. We would have seen a family of four struggling down an alley filled with pumice stones, desperately trying to escape the volcano Vesuvius that was erupting behind them. The city was Pompeii. I suspect you know the story. Leading the way in this family of four is a middle-aged man. He is carrying gold jewellery, all of his family's treasures. And he's also got in one hand the keys to the family home. Racing to keep up are his small daughters. One of the details we note is a braid of hair that she has tied lovingly behind her head. Close behind is the mum, scrambling frantically through the rubble with her skirts hitched up. She clutches in one hand an amber statuette of a little curly-haired boy, probably Cupid, and the family silver, as long, along with a lucky charm in the other, a medallion of fortune, the goddess of good luck. But for those of you who've seen images of those bodies entombed by the lava, in the city of Pompeii. You'd know that neither lucky charms nor family jewels can protect this family that day. Like thousands of others this morning, they are engulfed in an instant in this overwhelming cloud of ash and lava and smoke. And in the moment before he dies, there's this this incredibly poignant image of this man petrified in lava, pulling the corner of his cloak across his face in the the vain hope that this thin cloth could perhaps shield him from the onslaught that's coming his way. It's a sad picture, sadness, for this family of four. But we see madness here as well. 
as they grab hold of all their worldly treasures, their keys to the house. And it's a madness that the teacher sees in us all as well, in us all as well. The second half of verse 3 Halfway through verse 3, the teacher writes, Moreover, the hearts of all are full of evil. Madness. Madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. But whoever is joined with all the living has hope. Our youth group boys on Friday night thought this was hilarious. Everyone knows that a living dog is better than a dead lion. So of course, there's nothing funny about the fact that it took the death of Jesus. The death of the great Lion of Judah to deliver sinners like us, unworthy even to eat the crumbs that fall beneath our Lord's table. And yet Jesus died to deliver us from this city of destruction. And from the dogged punishment that our sins deserve. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, aren't we? Because from our teacher's perspective, see again in verse 5, it's so clear all the way through. From the teacher's viewpoint, from life under the sun, well, verse 5, the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing from under the sun. They have no more reward, and even the memory of them is lost. From under the sun, their love and their hate and their envy have already perished. From under the sun, never again will they have any share in all that happens under the sun. And if this life is all there is, no heaven above to fight for, no hell beneath to flee from, if indeed there is no resurrection of the dead, Well, as the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, (laughs) well, my preaching is useless, but so is our faith. Well, that's death. The first of these two great certainties in life under the sun. And the second is like it, not just death, but the taxes, the taxes of time and chance. Jump forward with me for a moment to verse number 11 in our passage today. Verse 11. Where our teacher, in a way, he's he's actually had a resurrection of sorts. He's come back from the dead. Literally, verse 11 begins with the words, I returned or I came back. And from this place of dark reflection, again he writes, I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favour to the skilful, but time and chance taxes us all. In fact, it's more graphic than that. The, The words there, the sense is this idea of time and chance collapsing in upon us. You can smell the vanity in the air. For no one can anticipate the time of their death, sorry, the time of disaster, like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, and the thing is, as you know, that nets and snares have in common. You can't see them coming. You can't see them coming. And so like fish in nets and birds in snares, so we are snared at a time of catastrophe when it suddenly comes raining down upon us like so much smoke and ash from a Vesuvian volcano. You remember that family of four fleeing through the streets of Pompeii? Across the other side of the city that day, there were 100 others huddled together in in an indoor gymnasium One of the victims, a doctor, he wasn't clutching his family treasures or keys to his chest, but 
was found frozen in time with a small box like this. And inside this small box were scalpels, tweezers and various other surgical tools. And I just wonder whether he grabbed this medical kit on the way out the door in the hope that perhaps he might be able to help someone once the danger has passed. The wisdom and skill of a good doctor, don't you wish that you could have a GP like him? The foresight to gather his tools and yet he suffers exactly the same fate as those who clutch their car keys or their kids, or their lucky charms. Not too dissimilar an example, actually, than the one the teacher chooses at the end of chapter 9, the example of the poor wise man, where the teacher paints for us a a picture in verse 13 of another small city and a great volcanic king bearing down upon it. And a man, in verse 15, a man of small means who delivers the city by his great intellect and strategy and skill. And yet not unlike the surgeon's tools in Pompeii that day, the great tool of this man's mind eventually went to waste. As we see in the story, this wise man's words were not heeded. They were soon forgotten. Just another breath, another breath of fresh havel in this life lived under the sun. Whew, heavy stuff. From the teacher's perspective, things are looking pretty bleak, yeah? There really are only two things in this life under the sun that we can be sure of, death and the taxes of time and chance. It would have been pretty easy for the teacher to say, I'm out, I'm done, get me off the boat. But he doesn't. You see, when faced with these imposing certainties in life, the teacher does something we might not have expected. He reads the ad in the paper, perilous journey, death likely, death certain and he replies to the ad he signs up for the expedition rather than throw up his hands in despair he lifts his hand and says I am in and he calls for us to do the same as well we jumped over it before verses 7 to 10 Because nestled between these two great certainties in life is a surprising, unexpected perhaps, a call to live. Seven seven separate doing words in the space of just four verses. And this in a book where doing words, where verbs are few and far between. Lots of observation, lots of reflection, not a lot of advice. Seven Words in the space of four verses. I wonder if we can count them all. The first, verse 7, is a call to go. The second, straight after, is a call to eat. The third, verse 7 again, is a call to drink. Why go, eat and drink? Well, the teacher says, because God's already given the nod to all these good things in life. The fourth doing word, verse 8. See there, verse 8. A call to dress in clothes that are fitting for the place you're in. The fifth, a call to refresh with oil on the head. The sixth, verse 9, a call to love, to enjoy life with our wife or with those that we love for those who aren't married. And the seventh, verse 10, a call to work, to be productive, to be creative. And to do it now in this life while it's there to be done. I've become increasingly convinced that this is more than just a throw up your hands in the air, eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow we die kind of ethic. 
No, the teacher is conscious that each day is a gift from God. Each day a gift. And these seven experiences are just some of the rich ways that we can enjoy the goodness that comes from our Heavenly Father in the everyday experiences of a life lived even under the sun. It's a call to life, not once, not twice, but seven times. Choose life, choose life, cries the teacher. And all this glass half full kind of optimism from a life lived completely under the sun, a life examined purely from a Havelian perspective. You know what I mean by that? Havel, a breath, a worldview that has consciously crossed out, drawn a line above us, crossed out the possibility of anything more beyond the grave. Choose life is the teacher's call. How much more How much more ought we to choose life today? When we view life from beyond the sun, as those in Christ can and do. From a life lived beyond the limits of death. From a life beyond the taxes of mere time and chance. From beyond the cross of Jesus, beyond the empty grave. The Apostle Paul continues back forward in 1 Corinthians 15. He writes, in fact, Christ has been raised. Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have died. How much do we need to hear that this week? How could we not choose life? when this same risen one said, I came that they may have life and have it to the full. Now strangely, ironically perhaps, wonderfully even, this call to life that we Christians experience, coupled with the resurrection of Christ, the sure hope of life beyond the grave, This call to life and the resurrection of Christ gives us the courage to hold loosely to the things in this world. Even the courage to let go. Just this week, the Dean of our Cathedral wrote the Faith Matters article in our local Armadale Extra. Some of you may well see it. On the issue of euthanasia, or voluntary assisted dying, as the bill proposes to put it in New South Wales. I wrote a similar letter to the editor this week in the Armadale Express. Some of you may have seen it. And there's some words from a chapter in a book that I quoted just a couple of weeks ago by Andrew Cameron, an excellent book called Joined Up Life, thinking about the Christian worldview, living life under the S-O-N son. And I just want to read a few words from Andrew Cameron's book on this question of euthanasia. Andrew Cameron writes, I've pointedly ignored a fight many Christians engage in. We fight for machines not to be switched off, even when no doctor has the slightest clue how to cure the patient. I believe this fight is often mistaken because it hasn't properly apprehended the Christian logic of the new future. Where we currently stand in the Bible's story arc, death always wins. Where we currently stand in the Bible's story arc, Death always wins. Death is only finally defeated when the new future comes. Given this sad truth, there comes a time for some when death has won. 
In fact, there comes a time for all of us. And Andrew Cameron writes, switching off life support is often the recognition of this truth. Curiously, the the call to life, coupled with the resurrection of Christ, can give us the courage to let go. But there is an uncrossable chasm between taking life on the one hand and letting one go on the other. These are complex, sensitive issues. And so I commend the Dean's article and this book to our community's reflection and prayer. But as we close, remember old Ernie Shackleton's ad in the newspaper? Here's one that I've worked up that the teacher might have written. Men and women wanted for hazardous journey. No wages. Not low wages. No wages, just taxes. Bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness. Safe return, impossible. Honour and recognition. Fleeting, going, gone. And yet still the teacher calls for us to sign up and choose life. To enjoy the good things God gives us in our albeit fleeting lives under the sun. Because of course over and above the two imposing icebergs of death and taxes, of time and chance, over and above these two certainties in life, there now towers a new certainty, a new third unshakable reality a stone rolled away, an empty tomb, an angel's voice. He is not here. He is risen. Death, taxes, and the resurrection of one poor man who delivered us all. One poor man whose message ought never to be forgotten. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? How ought we to live in light of Christ's resurrection and our resurrection and the certain judgment to come? Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my beloved Be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain.